Okay, so welcome everyone to the fourth installment of the lecture series Climate Controversies in Southeast Asia. Um, my name's Oliver Pai, and I'm from the Department of Southeast Asian Studies in, at Bonn University. And I'm very proud that we are organizing this session together with uh, the Fridays for Future um, student group at the, the Bonn University, and also together with the ASEAN House and the Philippine Bureau in Köln. Um, so we are organizing this lecture series, of course, not only because it's interesting academically, but because it's also very relevant for our future and for the future of the planet. So um, we have a great mix of scientists and activists from the region and people working on the region. And so far we've had three lectures. The first lecture was by Professor Philip Hirsch, who gave us a, an overview of some of the issues connecting climate change with other processes of environmental change and some of the conflicts and controversies in Southeast Asia and um, showing how climate change, the impacts of climate change, but also the, the measures taken against climate change and the discourses around climate change are very politicized and um, impacting different groups of people, different classes of people uh, in different countries in, in very different ways. Then we uh, heard from Professor Lian Tuan from um, the uh, uh, from Kanto University about the uh, impact of rising seawaters and salination on the Mekong Delta, which is something um, that's uh, similar to other areas in Southeast Asia, a lot of big cities in Southeast Asia that are um, on low lying land and who are being increasingly threatened by, by rising sea levels. Um, and last week we, um, oh, sorry, we had uh, um, Marinel Ubaldo from the Philippines, a, a climate, young climate activist who um, talked about the terrible impact that uh, climate change is having on, uh, on her country, particularly through um, making typhoons bigger and more dangerous, um, leading to uh, terrible uh, storms and loss of life. Um, but also some of the strategies that the climate justice movement is taking there, in particular, trying to make the big polluters liable uh, for their action. So this, um, this week we have um, Loretta Burke from the World Resources Institute. And um, I'm not gonna introduce her because my student, uh, Diana Tebus will be moderating this session today and she'll introduce the speaker and uh, take us through today's um, event. So Diana, I'll hand over to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Oliver. So like you hear it, my name is Diana Tebus or how you will, will be spelled like ever. <laughs> I am student at the Department for Southeast Asian St Studies and studied Indonesian language as well. The topic for this evening lecture is calcium carbonate calamity threats to the coral triangle from Loretta Burke. And we are very happy to welcome Loretta Burke from the World Resources Institute as our speaker tonight. Hi, Loretta. Uh, <laughs> Loretta Burke is a senior associate with the Sustainable Ocean Initiative at World Resources Institute. She has led World Resources Institute coastal ecosystem work since 2001, which focuses on producing high quality analysis and tools to improve management and foster resilience in coastal ecosystems. Loretta is a WRI led for the public private partnership for resilience and preparedness called PREP. Loretta, Loretta focuses on special analysis of threats to coral reefs, like in her project Reefs at Risk. And in Coastal Capital, makes Loretta an economic valuation of the goods and services that uh, coastal ecosystems provide to people and the shoreline protection services provided by mangroves. She's helping cities and coastal areas to be prepared for the future climate. 
previously wor she worked for the US EPA Global Climate Change Program and Loretta holds a master's in geography, master's in environmental and resource policy and a bachelor's degree in computer science. So, and before I hand over to Loretta Burke, I would like to explain how the lecture works. The lecture will last for about half an hour. After that, we have time for a discussion where everybody is welcome. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, so hand it over? Yeah, sorry, I hand <laughs> it over to you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, I certainly need to bring my CV a little more up to date. Um, the bachelor's in computer science <laughs> was at a time when I programmed on punch cards for those who know what punch cards were. Anyway, uh, <laughs> great to be here. <laughs> and I'm so delighted to use the name calcium carbonate calamity for a talk. I, I love alliteration, as you know, from Reefs at Risk and Coastal Capital, and I've always wanted to slip this title in there. So thank you much. Um, yeah, great title. I'm now sharing the screen, and let's see if we, yep. Um, so yes, I should mention, um, it, yeah, it really is a pleasure to be talking to a group of students um, in Germany who are interested in the Southeast Asia region and also others who are interested in the Coral Triangle. I, um, as came up in the description of my background, I'm a geographer. I am not a marine biologist. I'm not an economist. I am uh, someone that can work on any topic that occupies space, which is just about everything. And coral reefs has been a topic, um, it's a topic I love that I've managed to work on for many years. So I know lots of marine scientists and I've worked with them to try to characterize how threats in different parts of the world are doing, how reefs are doing in different parts of the world and what the threats are. And the reason there was a real need to take a spatial modeling approach to looking at coral reefs is very few reefs are monitored. You know, there are occasional assessments of condition at some reefs. Very few reefs have repeat monitoring, so you know what the trends are over time. And the data do not tend to get consolidated in a single place, though a group called the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network is currently working on a status of the world's reefs 2020 report, which will come out early next year, which will be more based on actual monitoring. Whereas what I will present is modeling of threats to coral reefs from multiple sources. So with that background, and mentioned that um, this report came out in 2012. So I haven't done any updates and I haven't even been to Southeast Asia since 2012. And what I'll cover in this talk is, first off, just to make sure we're all on the same page, what are coral reefs? I'll talk about the Reefs at Risk project series, um, the Coral Triangle, why it is so important to the world, the threats that um, affect that area, both local and global threats. I'll talk about the vulnerability of coastal communities to degradation and loss of coral reefs, what we know about protection and management of reefs after a fairly downer 20 minutes, we'll talk some about reasons for hope and I'll share some key resources and links. Uh, so if you wanna look more deeply, you are able. So I'm sure this won't work as an interactive thing, but I'll try it anyway. Um, I'm, I'm curious how well people understand what coral reefs are. And I'll ask it a very simple way. Are they animal, mineral, or vegetable? Meaning, is there an animal element? Is there a plant element? Is there, are there minerals involved? Anybody wanna take a stab? And I know it's early in the talk, so probably nobody wants to take a stab. 
go for it, someone. Was that a hand raise? Yes, I will take the step because I think that is all three of us. That is correct. <laughs> it is, it is all three. I mean, coral reefs are an ecosystem that's full of all sorts of species living on the reef itself. The coral is a structure. Um, it's a calcium carbonate base that has been built by the coral animal. And the individual coral polyp, so like the colony, like the brain coral you see, is a colony of individual polyps. And the polyps at night open up and filter feed. That looks a lot like a polyp, doesn't it? So they're sucking in, you know, plants and animals, they're sucking in food, but also in the outer surface of the coral of the polyp is an algae called zooxanthellae, which can photosynthesize and is an important source of energy for the coral. So the coral's growth, the coral nutrition is both from consumption, eating and photosynthesis. And then they're excreting the limestone to build the coral reef structure. So it's just a crazy organism. And, uh, you know, well adapted to the circumstances that they have been growing in, but less so to uh, circumstances as things evolve on our planet. The Reefs at Risk Project Series began in 1998 with the, the first global assessment of threats to the world's reefs. And we focused on what we call local threats. Overfishing, coastal development, pollution from ships and anchor damage, um, pollution from the land from watersheds. Um, so just local threats, not climate change. Many years later in 2011, we did uh, a global reefs at risk revisited. And here we covered the same local threats, but now also looked at climate related threats warming seas and acidifying seas to see the implications for coral reefs. And we also added an element to look at the um, social and economic vulnerability of coastal populations. So that was our big, big effort to do the global report in 2011. We then enhanced the content for Southeast Asia and the Coral Triangle region. Um, <clears throat> in the global report, Southeast Asia was a single region. In reefs at risk revisited in the Coral Triangle, we go down to the country level. We engage with lots of scientists within the region to get more detailed information about destructive fishing, um, marine, protect marine protected areas, and what they knew about the distribution of threats and status of reefs. It was a major undertaking, uh, many partners, many contributing institutions. It took about two years to do the global report and probably another nine months to do the Southeast, uh, the Coral Triangle version of that report. So, you know, with the dates in mind, the things I'll present are somewhat out of date, but things probably haven't changed all that much. And I do do a couple updates on things towards the end. Let's talk about what we mean by the coral triangle. Now, you should be able to see two lines on the map. One is this green shaded area, which is the ecologically defined coral triangle. This is the center of marine diversity for the world. It's home to 75% of all known coral species, about 600 coral species and between about 2,500 different species of fish and six out of seven sea turtle species. It is the center of the center. It is important, it's diverse, it's productive. The coastal populations are highly reliant on um, the things that reefs and mangroves provide in these coastal areas, but it's also the region that is most threatened by human activities. So that's the inner circle. Um, the outer line is the EEZ for the six countries 
that are part of the coral triangle. So it's in addition to Southeast Asia, insular Southeast Asia, it's also the Western Pacific. So Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Timor-Leste. Coral reefs provide important goods and services around uh, these coastal areas. Fisheries, so food and livelihood, they're a magnet for tourism, they uh, protect shorelines by reducing wave energy pretty significantly. And there's also an abundance of amazing species on coral reefs, and some have real potential for biopharmaceutical development. We estimate about 31% of the population across the six countries, so across the Coral Triangle region, are fairly are highly dependent on coral reefs. And, the, and we do this based on proximity. They are close to the coast and reasonably close to a coral reef, so are likely benefiting from these ecosystems. And you can see that by absolute numbers, the beneficiaries are highest in Indonesia and the Philippines, but at, on a percentage basis, it's the Solomon Islands where almost the entire population is very living very close to the coast and is benefiting a lot. But uh, the Philippines is also, for a large country, large population, that's a pretty high percentage of people highly dependent on coral reefs. Now, focusing on fisheries, this is coral reef associated fisheries, so fisheries that spend at least part of their life cycle in or on the reef. Uh, the countries with the most fishers globally, this is, uh, this is the most near shore fishers globally are the Philippines, Indonesia, and PNG. In the Solomon Islands, over 80% of households fish. Um, this is such a critical source of animal protein. We did some economic valuation way back when, and in 2010, these fisheries we estimated to be worth about one and a half billion in Indonesia and three quarters of a billion for the Philippines. Looking at reef tourism, coral reefs are a magnet for tourism, but in two distinct ways. One is for all the people, divers and snorkelers, people that want to do reef recreation, but also coral reefs produce the white sand beaches, produce the calm waters that people want to swim in. So there are <clears throat> sort of on reef and adjacent to reef or uh, side benefits from coral reefs that relate to tourism. And within the Coral Triangle region, there are some real super dive destinations and then a lot of more casual um, coastal tourism places. And these are an important source of foreign exchange. Um, and the sector was growing rapidly prior to COVID. We, um, in our study, we found that in Malaysia and Solomon Islands, it was already contributing, this is coral reef associated tourism, 9% of GDP. And in the Philippines and Indonesia, it was a smaller percent, but 130 million annually, and probably much more by now prior to COVID. Looking at the shoreline protection services provided by coral reefs, waves can attenuate up to 90% of the energy. I mean, sorry, reefs attenuate up to 90% of wave energy, so reduced flooding and erosion. Across the region, we estimated about 45% of the shoreline is protected by coral reefs. And our estimate of value of avoided damages in 2010 was that it was 800 million just in the Philippines and Indonesia, because those are the only places where we had numbers to go with. I collaborate with a group called Mapping Ocean Wealth, which is run by the Nature Conservancy. And we did a global mapping of shoreline protection value and which reefs are providing the highest value. And this looks at um, you know, how low lying is the land, how close is the development to the coast, how close are the reefs, and high to the surface. So the, the areas in dark brown, such as the Philippines, are really receiving a very high level of protection from coral reefs. 
and lesser in areas with the lighter colors. So in the reefs at risk study, we look at five local threats and two global threats. And I'll go through those in turn. Um, development too close to the coast, um, development that involves dredging or landfilling, discharge of sewage, um, and, and runoff from roads are all ways in which poorly designed coastal development will impact coral reefs. Also, far from the reefs, up in watersheds, when forests are cleared or um, farmland is tilled or excess fertilizer is applied or uh, animals are raised and the waste is not controlled, these nutrients and pollutants make their way to the sea and often out to coral reefs, um, really damaging things because corals like low nutrient water and also clear water because of uh, photosynthesizing. Marine based pollution and damage. So um, discharge from ships, um, oil and bilge water, uh, discharge of invasive species and also anchor damage from both large and small ships are important threats um, around the world, but less so in, in uh, the Coral Triangle compared with, for instance, the Caribbean. Overfishing is the most pervasive threat to coral reefs. In the Coral Triangle region, there has been extensive overfishing and the fish species being caught are getting smaller and smaller and there's been a shift from high value species to more herbivorous fish. You remove the herbivores that keep the algae in check and you wind up with algal overgrowth on the reefs. It is a sad progression that many people are working to reverse. Destructive fishing is such a bad idea and the Coral Triangle region is the center of where it's happening. And this includes fishing using dynamite where it's just easier to toss in a bit of dynamite or other explosive uh, to stun the fish. They float to the surface, you just scoop them up rather than the hard effort of fishing with a line or dragging a net. Also fishing with poisons where divers go down and squirt a bleach-like poison to stun fish which they can capture for the aquarium trade or live reef fish trade. And a blasted reef looks like that, rubble. So then warming seas, as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, um, well, as the world warms, the warming in the atmosphere, much of it, most of it is taken up by the ocean. So the ocean warms and um, coral reefs have all, you know, have a thermal tolerance. And there's regular fluctuations, but as our baseline rises, we pass that threshold more and more frequently. Coral reefs can survive infrequent and not severe bleaching, but if it's too intense or too frequent, then they're not able to bounce back. And that is the trend that we're currently witnessing on many reefs. Though in some narrow cases, um, more thermal tolerant algae repopulate after the bleaching. So the other threat has to do with CO2 in the atmosphere, which is then taken up by the ocean. The ocean becomes more acidic, and this causes a decrease in the availability of a mineral called aragonite. Coral reefs use aragonite to build in the building of their skeletons. So Reduced aragonite means slower coral growth and weaker coral skeletons. So it's leading to real structural problems and it also affects shellfish. So looking at all these threats, modeling them and bringing the results together. And this compares results for the coral triangle to the global average. In red are the results for the coral triangle. So we found about 35% of reefs in the region were threatened by coastal development. About 10% of reefs threatened by marine-based pollution and physical damage. About 45% threatened by watershed-based sources of pollution. 85% <clears throat> 
threatened by overfishing and destructive fishing, which is a lot higher than the global average. Then you combine those four local threats and find 85% of the reefs in the region are threatened by one or more of those threats. And in other metrics, we add these together and say whether it's low, medium, high, very high threat. We also looked at past thermal stress across the region for the previous, the 10 years prior to the study and found, well, some other reefs are likely to have been affected by bleaching. So the threat goes up a little bit more. I'm now gonna focus just on the local integrated threats. So when we combine all those local threats to coral reefs, this is the map that results. So you can see the top of the Great Barrier Reef here um, at the time was rated low threat and much of Papua New Guinea is, is low threat. But going up to the Philippines, um, the reefs are high and very high threat. So this mapping gives you a sense of the relative pressure from local threats across the region. And here are summaries by country. Uh, Timor-Leste doesn't have many reefs, but they're highly threatened. Also Malaysia, Philippines, lots of reefs, highly threatened. Indonesia, a, an enormous amount of reefs, a little bit less threatened. And Solomon Islands and PNG have the most reefs that were in the low or low and medium threat categories. So add on to this thermal stress. And here we have uh, projections from an ensemble of climate models for the 2030s and 2050s. And this shows um, the frequency with which ble uh, bleaching level thermal stress is likely to occur in the decade. So in the areas that are in the blues, bleaching might only occur one or two times in the decade. Once you're into yellow, it's five times. The oranges are uh, seven and higher, which is really too much for recovery. Also looking at acidification, based on the aragonite saturation state, areas which are in the blues have adequate aragonite for coral growth. Get into the yellows, it's marginal, get into the oranges, it's extremely marginal, and call it inadequate for coral growth. So this is the original map of local threats for the region. Now we're gonna add climate change and acidification, and you'll see the change in the palette. So this is just going from 2010 to 2030 to 2050. And what you find is the reefs that were low threat at the time of the study are having increasing pressure because of the combined pressures of warming sea and acidification. Um, I'll just do a couple of the country summaries. And in the report, there's detail on all, all the countries. So Indonesia contains 16% of the world's reefs. 60 million people are considered reef dependent. That's 25% of the country's population. 95% of the reefs are threatened by local activities. And sadly, 90% of reefs are threatened by overfishing or destructive fishing. So that is an enormous threat that needs to be controlled. Um, Malaysia, a much smaller amount of coral reefs, also highly threatened by overfishing and destructive fishing. In Papua New Guinea, um, the situation is a bit better. Uh, PNG contains 6% of the world's reefs. We feel about 30% of people are reef dependent. Um, half of the reefs in PNG are threatened by overfishing and 35% by watershed based sources. So without climate change, a more manageable situation in PNG. Philippines, so highly dependent on coral reefs, 45% of the population in a country that includes 9% of the world's coral reefs. And the population lives very close to the coast in the Philippines, uh, lots of fishing, and sadly, um, 
70% of reefs are threatened by destructive fishing alone. Solomon Islands, uh, the situation is a little bit better. 70% of reefs are threatened by local activities and it's a mix of overfishing and watershed-based pollution. So what does degradation of coral reefs mean for um, these countries and the coastal populations? We did an analysis that made use of those threat maps. So we're looking at risk and the integrated local threat index is what we used as risk along the coast. But then we also looked at reef dependence and capacity of the coastal populations to adapt. So for reef dependence, we looked at the percentage of the population that we felt was reef associated, how many people are working in fisheries, um, what's their nutritional dependence on fish, um, how much are they exporting of fish, how dependent are they on tourism, and how much of their coastline is protected by coral reefs. For adaptive capacity, we looked at um, wealth in the country, educational level, um, health availability, levels of governance, lack of corruption, access to markets, and whether there's an alternative food source, how good are, is agriculture within the country. And when we bring those together, first looking at economic dependence, so we see, um, for the Solomon Islands and the Philippines, they rated very high economic dependence on coral reefs. The other countries in the region were rated as high. When we look at capacity to adapt, so based on wealth, educational status, alternative sources of food, we find um, in PNG and Solomon Islands, they were rated as having the lowest adaptive capacity the other countries in the region were just low, which still is not great, but not as bad as P and G and Solomon Islands. So combining that with the threats, almost all of the countries in the Coral Triangle region wound up in the very high social and economic vulnerability category with the exception of um, two states on Borneo, uh, two Malaysian states on Borneo rated as medium or high because of more economic resources and more alternatives. So let's now look at reef management, which is important for reducing threats to coral reefs. We used um, the World Database on Protected Areas and tried to determine how effective um, marine protected areas are or were in the Coral Triangle region. So just because an MPA is established doesn't mean it's offering any protection. Many are just paper parks. So we looked at things like existence of a management plan, existence of staff and resources to actually enforce regulations to see if we could determine whether a, um, an MPA was actually doing something to protect the coral reefs. Also, some are no-take areas where fisheries is not allowed, and that would be a very effective um, marine protected area. So this is the mapping that we did back in uh, 2010, 2011. And summarizing reefs, 84% of reefs are outside of MPA. So only 16% of reefs fall within an MPA and only 6% of coral reefs were in an MPA rated as effective or partially effective. So that's not a great scorecard on management of resources within the region. But this was a 2011 report. Lots of people are doing lots of work trying to expand MPAs and improve um, enforcement and effectiveness. This is something um, that I picked up through the Coral Triangle Partnership about the growth in MPAs um, in terms of area and numbers, and particularly in PNG, the Philippines and Solomon Islands. Um, in addition to officially gazetted marine protected areas, there are also these locally managed 
Marine Areas or LMMAs, and there are lots of them, and they're run by the community. And they're often effective, like sensibly run for trying to keep fishing pressure in check. Um, I did an update on just how many reefs are inside marine protected areas and it's gone up from 16 to 19% of reefs in the coral triangle countries. So there are some reasons for hope. Um, for me, there's a couple of reasons for broad categories of reasons for hope. One is, although the overall trend for coral reefs is not good because there's so many threats and there are these growing global threats, coral reefs can be resilient in the face of climate change. If the local threats are kept low enough and the ble bleaching isn't too extreme, they can bounce back. In some ways they can bounce back in a more thermal tolerant state and persist into the future. So resilience, the resilience of the reef is a cause for hope. And the other is the number of groups be it government or intergovernmental efforts or NGOs, large and small NGOs that are focused on the Coral Triangle because it is such a big deal on the planet. Um, trying to expand protected areas, trying to work with communities to share science and co-develop management plans. So there is expansion of marine protected areas there's work on alternative livelihoods to get people away from fishing, more into craft making and tourism related occupations that might be less damaging to the reefs. So an important initiative is the Coral Triangle Initiative on Coral Reefs, Fisheries and Food Security, which is um, a six government international initiative, which I think, um, came into existence 2008, 2009, but I'm not certain of that. I'm not sure of what year it began, but um, the overarching goals of um, the CTI are designating and managing, they call it seascapes, but it's basically marine areas, use of ecosystem-based approaches to fish, fisheries. So thinking really about sustainability and the value that you can get out of managing a fishery sustainably. Networks of marine protected areas, um, managing with resilience in mind. So being prepared for climate change, responding to alerts about warming is coming, get your ducks in a row, reduce any stressors immediately. Um, and also they're, they have a focus on protecting threatened marine species. And they're quite big into sharks and tuna um, because they're such high value species. So as I mentioned, lots of um, NGOs, including big NGOs are focused on the Coral Triangle. This is a slide from WWF. They're doing uh, work on plastic pollution, sustainable fisheries, and aquaculture, sustainable marine tourism, but also uh, MPAs. So we are seeing better coordination on international policy and management. I think the efforts are leading to increased awareness across the region uh, about the value of these resources and how threats are damaging them and causing loss in those values. I mentioned the expansion of both types of protected areas. There's a fair bit of work on restoration of mangroves and some on coral reefs. And that's not the easiest way to save the world's coral reefs, but it can make a contribution. And there's an important element of larval connectivity. So a coral reef as a source of seed for other coral reefs. So keeping some small pockets healthy such that when conditions become good enough for a coral reef to return, the larvae are available. That's very important. So uh, the science is also improving. Um, <clears throat> a new approach called resilience-based management where you're really managing for climate change and you're taking local threats and the global threats into account 
in developing management plans. Um, with satellite imagery, we're now um, having much more detailed maps of coral reefs and also much better near real-time data on warming seas um, and bleaching alerts. So what's the current temperature, but how long has it lasted and how bad is it gonna get? And lots of science looking at thermal tolerance in um, the zooxanthellae, so the um, symbionts in the algae. Um, sometimes during a bleaching event, the existing algae is expelled, and sometimes, if you're lucky, a more thermal tolerant one uh, takes up that space once the threat is reduced. So what do we need to do? Reduce local pressures, particularly unsustainable fishing, especially um, destructive fishing, blast fishing and fishing with poisons, managing coastal development and tourism in sustainable ways, um, don't develop too close to a coral reef, um, treat that sewage, and tourism operators span the gamut of being very sensitive and ecologically aware to not. So choice of tourism, tourism operator is important. Mangroves are super important for trapping sediment and nutrients uh, coming into coastal waters. Managing for climate change. Um, you know, having this awareness of bleaching events coming and trying to reduce local threats as much as you can uh, before that. The big one, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, shooting for that elusive 350 part per million target, and in general, live sustainably. Think about how your actions affect um, the global environment and coral reefs. So here, um, for more information, lots of um, links. The Coral Triangle Initiative, as mentioned, the Coral Triangle Atlas came out of the reef-based project and has lots of maps focused on the Coral Triangle. A new initiative out of Vulcan, the Allen Coral Atlas, is doing this very high-resolution mapping of coral reefs. NOAA, US NOAA Coral Reef Watch, does the sea surface temperature mapping and bleaching alerts. Um, an effort called the MPA Atlas takes um, the protect planet maps of MPAs and gathers information from multiple sources to figure out level of effectiveness and, and where the no-take zones are within the MPAs. Mapping Ocean Wealth is a nice website providing maps of the value of mangroves and coral reefs globally. Resource Watch is a WRI platform that I work on some in that we are building an Ocean Watch on Resource Watch. And the first components of that will be focused on coral reefs and will come out probably late January of next year. Um, the Reef Resilience Network is a partnership of coral reef managers and also a science consolidator. So if you want to learn more about what's understood about bleaching and resilience and how to manage for it, um, it's a great resource. The Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, I mentioned this, does lots of regional status reports, but they'll do a global report early next year. The Reefs at Risk series, um, there was one on Southeast Asia in 2002, then the Global revisited 2011 and Coral Triangle in 2012. Oops. Um, a link on what you can do personally to protect coral reefs, and it has to do with not wearing the wrong type of sunscreen if you're diving, um, you know, picking sustainably caught seafood, picking a sustainable tourism provider, and the like. And the last thing is a video, a four minute video that sort of is a cartoon um, with Celine Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau's granddaughter narrating and a cartoonist um, sort of doing the whole story of threats to coral reefs, their value and um, what needs to happen to protect them. And I think it's a nice short watch and something worth sharing if you want to educate people. About coral reefs. Thanks a lot. 
Yeah, thank you, Loretta Burke, for your great presentation. Um, at, at first, is it possible that you can send your presentation to Oliver Pie? Then we can sure. can uh, review everything and have the internet addresses to share and so on. Sure. So, okay. Um, yeah, now we can start our discussion. Everybody is welcome to uh, ask his or her questions. Um, some of my komliton, I don't know the English word, <laughs> um, can ask as well at first. And after that, everybody is welcome as well. And is it possible to ask your question in the chat? You will see it in your menu. Okay. Who's first? <laughs> <laughs> <Me? Yuta>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Loretta, I thank you very, very much for that lecture. It was quite elucidating. Um, I think you almost answered any question we would have, but I have additional questions though. Um, so what I took, because I took down a lot of notices and um, what I remember when you, when you were speaking, what I remember, um, I mean to, to um, bring health again to these coral reefs. I, uh, it is, it's three, four years ago that I suddenly on TV watched um, a, a film about that they take the corals, so the young corals, they put it to the land in aquariums or whatever, and um, they, un until they, they get um, to a certain age or a certain amount, I don't know, and that they try to put it back um, yeah, I, I mean to, to help with the reef to, to recover. Is that a program that still exists and it, has it been successful? Um, yes, it still exists. It's not a single program, but there are multiple programs working on coral restoration is what it's often called. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, within that reef resilience network, um, there is um, a, a line of work on restoration and guidance for reef managers on restoration. And restoration has promise. Um, the, the, the way I think of it is, if a coral reef is severely de degraded or has died, there's a reason that has happened, right? Yeah, and it might be pollution, it might be blast fishing, and if you don't mitigate the stress, if you don't create a favorable condition, the newly planted coral will not survive. So a lot of it, you have to have good conditions in order for restoration to work. Granted, you can try to seed new areas and they do things with, um, now, a lot of it is just um, substrate, having a clean surface in clean water and either a supply of larvae that might be happy to land there or you do the plantings from the aquarium, right? Yeah. And they do these things with what are called reef balls. They're big yeah. cement structures that have holes in them. So there's a lot of structure. And by the way, coral reefs are largely about structure. I mean, there's a lot of life and diversity, but really what fish love about coral reefs is the nooks and crannies and all the places you can hide. Mm. And so with a reef ball, you also have all these structures and, and you know, people sometimes sink, you know, subway cars, train cars or buses once they've been cleaned up to provide clean substrate that stuff can then grow on, right? Because, for instance, when you do blast fishing, you're left with this pile of rubble, and rubble is a shifting mass that you can't do anything with because it's not solid, there's not a clean surface. So reef restoration can work, but the conditions have to be right. And I would say this is a growing area. Um, and the group, uh, Reef Resilience is the group that comes to mind. Um, but there's, there's another, I think CCOR is a group that also works on, um, on restoration and 
One other name as a reference. Um, in Australia, there's the RAP, Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program. And there's also something called the Coral Restoration Consortium, which is uh, a mix of scientists, managers, and coral restoration practitioners yeah. who are working on the topic. So it's it's an important area, but as I said, it only works if you've reduced the threats that caused the degradation in the first place. Yeah, and this is uh, included uh, the question I came up with uh, as next. So I, I don't. I want to encourage the others to to join the discussion. I don't want to do it alone. Um, but the next question was, um, of course, you have to reduce the threat. And um, if you go to climate change, um, I mean, that is a global problem. I, I don't think that um, uh, countries like the Philippines or Indonesia can do it alone. So anyhow, they need the, the help of the, of the international community. Um, but we see that, that um, yeah, it is very difficult, um, the negotiations about when China is refusing or other countries say, well, we still have to develop. So I think, um, it is very difficult to, to uh, reduce these threats. What do you think to that? The global threats are not to be controlled by any coral yeah. reef holding country. So in the interim, until the global community gets their act together to control greenhouse gas emissions, then the only thing to be done is to manage the local threats Okay. Because it's really all about cumulative threat on the reefs. Um, the compound, you know, the pollution, the overfishing, the removal of herbivores. So you're in a weakened state, speaking from the coral perspective, and, um, and then there's warming and slowed growth due to acidification. It's too much. So the thing that can be controlled and this is what resilience-based management is about, is um, taking the whole suite of threats together and also looking at the people that are relying on these resources, mm. how they're using them, how they need to use them, what they want in the future to come up with strategies to reduce local threat and um, just lessen the cumulative threat, honoring the fact that at present we can't control the global threats. Yeah. May I ask a question that Thank connects? You very much, yeah, yeah that sorry, that I want point. to say, yeah, you yeah. have the word, Thomas. Okay. Yes, Loretta, thank you very much. And I'm very glad to have an expert on call who I can ask this question because I'm from Australia and we had, of course, huge uh, bleaching events at the uh, Great Barrier Reef. And we often hear about local factors and we know about acidification, climate change. And I was wondering, um, while you say in the interim, it's, it's good to control the local factors that we, we have control over, um, how would you weight the, the, the two uh, factors, climate change versus local factors? What weight do you give to them first and second, at what point in terms of CO2 concentration does it become futile to even think about local factors? And how close are we to that? I mean, based on the fossil record, when, when do calls cut out? Okay. Um, on the local versus global weighting, it really depends on location. And this is an analysis that I've done in the past like teasing out how much of the threat was from um, global factors versus local factors by decade. And I don't, I don't remember those results offhand, but as you saw, the majority of reefs across the region, um, I guess 85% uh, across the region had at least one local threat you know, without the global threats on top of that. Then, I mean, the global threats are not even, no matter what our CO2 concentration is, there's going to be 
uneven warming um, due to upwelling and shading and cloudiness and sediment in the water. So it's not a uniform bleaching. There are you know, really fine scale patterns of bleaching. So a lot is unpredictable. Is it hopeless? I think not. And despite all the work that I've done in this topic and the fact that, you know, I don't read all the literature, but I read some and I talk to lots of coral reef scientists, there is so much uncertainty. Um, but I, I hold an optimism, um, not about the majority of the world's reefs doing well 50 years from now, but a good persistence of coral reefs 50 years from now. So we're gonna lose a lot, but we're not gonna lose them all. And retaining a decent amount allows the recovery once we do get the global factors under control. And there are groups, there's an analysis I didn't mention, it's called the 50 Reefs Portfolio, where uh, it must have been 20 different organizations got together and looked at past thermal stress, um, current threats to reefs and projections of future warming. I think they looked at acidification also um, to develop an investment portfolio, basically, so they could go to donors and say, like, these are the really high value reefs that stand a good chance of persisting, but they need a little help. And, you know, so um, there is pessimism, but it's not hopeless. So they're beautiful. They provide so much. Um, and in the future, you know, there might come a point where even more active action is required um, with regard to restoration or the swapping of these um, symbionts, the algae. Like a reef has bleached, bring in a source of a more thermal tolerant algae and squirt it or whatever the technical term is. I mean, I, um, for a number of years, I hadn't been working on coral reefs because WRI had changed focus and I was doing uh, climate resilience work. But this was during my time in Berlin and I was invited to a coral reef symposium in Brennan, Bremen, which was the most optimistic coral reef meeting I had ever gone to because it was full of scientists who were doing work on thermal tolerance and they didn't include a presentation on status and trends of the world's coral reefs. So it's the first time I left a coral reef meeting feeling optimistic about things. So, you know, it's not good overall, but we can, we can save some reefs and uh, reduce local threats. It's, a, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what actions will have what outcomes, but all we can do is try and learn from it and take that knowledge into the next, the next approach. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Maxi, do you have still a question? Did I say yeah. it right? Okay. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, first of all, for your great presentation. I was uh, able to follow you the whole time. Um, and I would like to ask you if you give us some examples for uh, for programs of governments in Southeast Asia uh, afford to rescue the coral reefs. Uh, how effective do you think they are addressing to threats of uh, climate change? Well, I think they're all trying. I think um, the Coral Triangle Initiative is a very important collaboration. And with such international efforts, it brings a fair bit of money to the countries in the region for coral reef management. So that's a good thing. Um, 
for instance, I've, I've spent more time in the Philippines than any of the other countries. And there, um, it's lots of locally based marine reserves. So it's very decentralized government, decentralized approach to the marine managed areas um, with support from, um, from the government, but also from um, bilateral aid, both technical support and financial support to improve management in these areas. And the Philippines has had a couple real success stories. Um, one that comes to mind is an area called Tubataha Reefs. It's a fairly offshore marine reserve that um, was established maybe in 1980. It has since become a world heritage site. They've done a great job of enforcing the fishing regulations. And that makes all the difference. Uh, reduced fishing pressure. Um, so they've got plenty of herbivores, keep keeps things under control and lots of large fish and, and sharks have come back. Um, in, e in Indonesia, um, a colleague of mine, um, a collaborator, let's say, works on a large USAID funded project, but with the government of Indonesia, designing marine protected area networks to improve food security. I think Indonesia recognizes the problem and has put a good deal of effort into expansion of protected areas. Um, in general, probably too much work goes on on gazetting and establishing an area, but not enough on funding the enforcement of the regulations within an area. But awareness is growing about that. And I think there is some improvement. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next I would like to read two questions in the chat. So yeah. At first from my Jibing. Interesting presentation, Loretta. Thank you. Might be I miss your presentation about this. Not sure. There are plan for seabed mining in Pacific Ocean. Example, Papua New Guinea. Also proposed of submarine tailing disposal for nickel mines and smelter waste in eastern part of Indonesia. Especially is increasing interest as increasing of raw material for energy transition globally especially China and Europe. What do you think about this? Sorry, increasing demand of raw material. Well, I wasn't aware of this, but it does not surprise me. Capitalism is an economic system that does not really support the well-being of coral reefs or other resources. Unrestrained capitalism is the problem. I mean, this is the thing, there are resources, they have value. Um, you know, countries want um, to sell things, they want export earnings, um, but they also have to think about the implications and the effects and sort of a cost benefit analysis in the sense, what do you gain, what do you lose? And, you know, since I haven't been in the region in nearly a decade, I can't speak much to the governance situation there. But from what I remember, there were local groups that, I mean, I can speak much better to what's going on in the Caribbean where, you know, in Belize, similar problems. There's lots of natural resources that um, the government would love to sell, but there's such an active um, civil society that is able to publicly, vocally pressure the government that they have caused the change, um, the banning of oil exploration in the waters of Belize, for example, and um, a ban on taking of, of parrotfish, the herbivore. So I've seen cases where civil society really makes a difference on regulations and exploration and sale of resources. I, 
I'm not familiar with this situation, so I really can't speak to that. Sorry. Okay, next question is from Joyce Yep. No, I hope I spelled it right. Thank you so much for your excellent, inspiring talk, Loretta. I have a question at first. How do you make local governance warlords in Southeast Asia who stigmatize and even criminalize environmental rights laws and advocates listen to scientists on this topic? Um. I don't know that scientists are always the best spokespeople for a resource. And I'm going to use a second example from Belize. And that is the country where I've had the most on the ground experience. Um, there, we did an economic valuation of coral reefs and mangroves in Belize. WI led it. And we did it in collaboration with a couple of government agencies, but also a lot of local NGOs. And with a local partner working closely on data collection and methodology, so that when we finished the economic valuation, the results were really understood by a wide body of people. And our partners had really good access to both the prime minister and the minister of fisheries. So on the day that we launched the results, they had it built into a video about the economic value of the Belize Barrier Reef that was shown to the prime minister that evening. And it resulted in legislation that had been languishing getting signed within two weeks. So I think economic valuation is an important tool for leveraging change. Sometimes using science um, is not enough unless it's communicated really clearly. So you need, you need a good communication channel, you need a public pressure campaign, you need indicators or numbers that people can relate to and dollar value. So we've done analysis in um, reefs at risk in Southeast Asia, we looked at the economic value of fisheries, tourism, and shoreline protection in the Philippines and Indonesia, and what would be lost as a result of reef degradation. And those sorts of numbers, what you're going to lose because we're not managing resources well, or because, you know, something's being sold and that area is going to get destroyed. Those are important numbers to get a reaction, both out of the local stakeholders, but also the government. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but clear communication and meaningful indicators. That's what I'd go for. Okay, Joyce Yapno answered, yes, thank you so much for your answers. <laughs> okay, maybe one last question because the time is running out. Otherwise I would give Loretta the last words okay <laughs> Loretta do you want to say something at the end or <laughs> well, I know that th I'm just going to ask a question like this group of students is learning a lot about Southeast Asia and different aspects of governance and um, environmental threats across the region I guess in these times of pandemic, you're not doing field trips there. But um, is, are people um, interested in research in the area in the future? Is that part of the interest um, of people in the program? I mean, it's, I'll just say it's a, it's a wonderful, a, a culturally fascinating area, um, beautiful in so many places um, with, you know, many problems that need external um, input and help. And I am going to throw in one random observation. In my time working on coral reefs in different countries, some of the people that 
made a lot of difference in those places originally came to the country as Peace Corps volunteers. So a two year stint and they happened to have a Marine or Coastal assignment and they fell in, the lo in love with the place and probably with a person and uh, married and stayed and made a career there. And so in working with lots of different conservation groups, I find, um, you know, there's a lot of dropping into places, working for a couple of weeks, running a workshop, going back, trying to do it all remotely. I find long term commitment of individuals such that, you, you know, you're sort of bringing in deep expertise on a topic, you're aligning with a local group, you're developing a long term relationship, you understand the local issues. So a real mixing and melding of cultures, that's when I've seen um, the greatest advances. But that's from my limited sample because it's all the um, US funded Peace Corps volunteers are always happy to talk to me. So maybe I have a biased sample, but long-term commitment to a place really makes a difference. That's my closing tip. Thank you. <laughs> I make the volunteer many years before as well. So I join your opinion. <laughs> okay, so now the time is running out and we are finished with our discussion. And yeah, I can say it again. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, yeah, Oliver, do you want to say anything else or? I am not sure who makes a, a um, present next presentation. I'm going to make it. Ah, sorry, Koray. <laughs> so maybe you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, sure. I share up my display here. So our next guest next week is um, Ms. Siti Maimuna. Uh, because about gender and struggles over coal in Indonesia. And uh, Siti Maimuna is an Indonesian scholar activist. She's an ecological ju justice activist and doctoral candidate at the University of Passau. And uh, she made a research which is focusing on coal mining, ethnicity and resistance, especially in the uh, Kalimantan area in Borneo Island. So this will be our topic for next week. And I would be happy if you jo join us here for next week. Yeah, thank you, Karai. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll just uh, also say thank you so much, Loretta. That was a, a really uh, inspiring presentation, very devastating, but at the same time you managed to offer a glimpse of hope and um, also a perspective of uh, what our students and maybe uh, students involved in, in the Fridays for Future could, uh, could do and how they could become involved. So anyone who wants to pursue this uh, focus with uh, the coal reef, um, uh, the coal triangle uh, in research or uh, volunteer work, um, give us a call at the department. Maybe we can uh, set something up and uh, yeah, maybe we can collaborate with uh, Loretta and, and some of her contacts in the region to to make a difference in a small way. Um, so thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed it and I am happy to take follow up questions and point you to resources. Good.